They say that the handsaw is the smartest tool we have in our woodworking arsenal. Unlike a hand plane that requires constant fiddling to work properly or a chisel which demands everything from us, a handsaw requires very little effort from our part in order to cut a straight line. All it wants to do in its life is to eat every single morsel of fiber you put in front of it. So, welcome to Worth the Effort Woodworking as today we start talking about the handsaw. Now, if you'd ever needed proof that Darwin was right, look no farther than the handsaw. I mean, from before the Egyptian age, all the way up to about maybe World War II, they've continued to develop to take advantage of their favorite power source. I mean, seriously, we have found serrated flint stones attached to sticks that they were, the cavemen were using just as we use back saws today. How far along have we developed this tool since the caveman era? It just has birds have developed into a wide variety of species. You know, you got the giant condors down to the smallest of hummingbirds, all specialized to take advantage of a specific food source. These saws have developed over the ages to eat very unique types of fiber. That is to say, over the centuries, they've evolved to take advantage of their favorite food source and make it easier, more effective, and more enjoyable to be fed. So to understand saws, we first need to talk about a little biomechanics and kinesiology. Now that might sound like a big high-end academia subject matters, and yeah, there are people that spend decades learning the fine minutia in order to find, uh, answer some very specific questions. But like a lot of times, I find that the, it doesn't take you knowing all the terminology to understand the big concept, and that's what we're talking about in the big concept. I mean, after all, this is just basically applying the scientific principle to how our body moves, stuff we experience, see, do, real, real stuff that we can observe. Besides, I've always found that what intimidates me about higher end subject matter is mainly just the terminology. Because most of the time, the concepts, the theories, they just make sense. I mean, you can, an average person can understand them. You might not get the terms, but who really cares? It's the overall principle we're going for. So bear that in that mind as we talk about this. Yeah, my terminology might be horrific, but we're going for the big principle here. So, to move forward, let's talk about golf. Okay, now, the sport of golf basically has three types of clubs. You have your putters, the fine little things that get you in the hole. You have your irons that get you up on the green. And then you have your drivers, the tools that require the most muscle. This tool's only job is to get the ball as far down the fairway as possible. Accuracy be damned as long as you land within the football size width of the fairway. Every single muscle in your body, from down to your toes, your calves, your necks, your core, your back, your quads, your lats, everything, just so that you can pound that thing all the way through the fairway. Uh, kids, don't play golf in the house. Now, the next tool in a golfer's arsenal is his irons, or his set of irons. And these tools are designed to add a little precision to it. They want, they want to be able to pitch it up onto the green as close as to that hole as possible. So they're adding a little bit of control on it. And what do they do with their body mechanics? They reduce the effort. They reduce the number of muscles. They reduce the motion. Basically, all they come up to do is they come up, they grab their pitch, they maybe choke up a little bit, and they take half swing. Oh, damn. The final tool in their arsenal, the putter. And the key thing about the putter is how they use it. You don't see them taking swings at all. In fact, when they come up to the ball, they basically stabilize everything, lock everything out, 
and only move the fewest of muscles they possibly can, taking a very slow... Is that supposed to bounce? You see, saws understand that us humans, we start out with about 300 bones and end up with about 206. Yeah, think on that one for a little bit. It's kind of weird. We also have over 700 named bone-moving muscles able to contract and move a joint in a single direction. Hence, any one of our over 230 joints require at least two muscles, one to contract it one way, one to contract and pull it back or they require entire muscle groups. I mean, think about how many muscles are in your leg just to move it back and forth. Or your shoulders, I mean, they're coming in from the front, back, up, down, left, right, all over the place. Entire muscle groups acting on joints. I mean, us humans are really powerful animals and we needed, we can magnify that power by using the leverage provided by our joints. I mean, think about it, a rock crawler can actually hold its entire weight with just the muscles in their fingertips and the leverage provided by those joints. That's a lot for a saw to deal with. So they've come up with two strategies as they evolve. They're either going to totally use a muscle or they're going to completely immobilize it. Big muscles and big muscle groups are going to be able to get a lot of work done. I mean, Usain Bolt, have you ever seen him sprint? He's using everything, including the muscles in his face, to get down that 100 in around nine and a half seconds. But he would never be able to do that one if he had to run down a tightrope. He's not very accurate. He needs that big, wide lane to explode all of that power down the path. Now, I want you to think about one of the most delicate things we do practically on a daily basis. Writing. And how do we write? Do we use our whole arm? No, we basically elbows on tables, wrist on the piece of paper. We're using just our fingertips, the most delicate thing. At that level, the precision is unreal because half of a pencil line and our letters don't look right or the eyeball doesn't look right when we're drawing. It's incredibly delicate and what do we do? We have to isolate body movement. Saws so understand this. They understand it's the limitation of their power source. So they have evolved to accommodate. Okay, let's look at one of the most efficient tools out there. The bucking saw in the logging industry. Basically, it's a two-man saw, and those guys are going to use their entire body motion to come up, from legs up to move the whole thing. The saw is designed so that on the farthest reach to the farthest back, that's the entire length of the saw that the human can use. So they're going to use every single muscle in their bodies, including their legs. That's where they're getting a lot of their strength. Their big back muscles, their chest, their abs, their cores, everything to efficiently cut a log in half. Now, are they going to worry about accuracy? Not really. I mean, if they get that log within an inch or two, I'm sure the logging company is going to be perfectly happy on that one. They're going to square it up at the end anyways. They're just getting the mass section done. It gets a lot of work done. Accuracy be damned. In the ripping configuration where you're making long planks out of a log, same situation. You have an old timey pit saw designed to get a lot of work done. I mean, they, they were taking these big long logs and they saw like a foot every minute or so like that using their entire body length. The guy on top will be going from above his head down to the bottom of his feet. Same with the guy on bottom, either pulling or lifting it back up for the guy to push back down again. Lots of body movement. But were they really concerned with accuracy? Not so much. I mean, if they got within an eighth of an inch, a half an inch, they were generally happy. Big body movements, lots of power, not so concerned with accuracy. Now, obviously, I had to draw these because I'm not going to have these to show you as an example. You've seen my figure. I don't do this heavy lifting work. I'm going to use a chainsaw to do this kind of stuff. Once again, a chainsaw. Big old curve. Not too concerned about accuracy. It's going to be rough, but it gets the job done. Now, at the opposite end from the pit saws and the bucking saws is the dainty little dovetailing saw. The one that seems to get all the glory nowadays. This saw, it takes tiny little bites. Its main purpose is to split a knife line. Accuracy is its only goal. It is not concerned with speed or getting a lot of work done. Accuracy is what it's all about. And look at the length. 
it is so short that you can operate this entire saw from its toe to its heel using very few muscles. You are not going to bring in your chest, your back and stuff. It's just a few muscles in the elbow, a few muscles in the biceps and triceps gaining most accuracy. Everything else stays immobilized. Now those are two extremes. Uh, you have a wide variety of other workbench type saws that just use variations. If they're using a lot of muscle, they're trying to get the work done. If they're going for accuracy, they are isolating body movement. So let's look at some of the common saws I would use at my workbench. Some are ripped, some are cross cuts. If you don't understand the difference, you really do need to go back to chapter one in this series and watch that first video, an introductory to woodworking. This is somewhat of a textbook, and as much as I would like to know what you are learning, being able to interact and feed off of you, this is not a two-way streak of communication. So I've got to assume that you understand the previous lessons as you come along forward. So we are just going to move forward with the idea that you understand the difference between a rip and a cross-cutting saw. And we are not even going to be talking about things like bow saws, flush cut saws, Japanese saws. These are just the traditional European style bench saws that we use most often today in a hybrid woodworking shop. So first up, let's grab a hand saw. This is a distant D8. It's one of the longer ones I could use because it is a little bit longer than my arm. Meaning I can use this full saw plate with just my arm motion. And that's typically how these things are used. This is a rip saw, and I got it a little bit longer than I can use for a specific reason. I will talk about that later or the end. But it is generally designed to be used with some kind of bench where you can put the wood down, you put your weight on top of it, and you come through. Now, accuracy does come into account with this saw. You generally want to get real close to the line when you're ripping a long board, and then you'll plane back to it. But the closer you get to it, the less planing you have to do. So, what happens is you isolate the body's motion. Look at this. All I am doing is using my arm, my chest, and my back, my lats, to work my way down a bench. To gain power and control, I am using some fairly large muscle groups, but I am also isolating the bottom of my uh, body to gain a little bit of accuracy. The same is true with the crosscut versions. I use these cheap $20 ones you buy at the big box store Stanley's. They aren't very good for anything, but they're cheap. And I can put them in the hands of students and if they destroyed them, I didn't really care. But the same thing, you use them for crosscuts. You will see me use this a lot of times in my video to break down 2x12s and stuff like that because that's its main purpose for me. Next up is a tenon saw. Basically, it's got a lot of depth so it can go down. And look at the length. This saw is designed to do quite a bit of work. There's various people that talk about how different types and categories of cut. Some people could say a first, second, third class, where the first class has to not only look good, but be accurate. A second class just has to be accurate. A third class doesn't have to look good or be very accurate. That would be like using the hand saws to make long ribs cuts where you plane back to the line. Well, a tenon saw it doesn't have to look good because it's inside a piece of wood. Nobody's ever going to see it. But it has to be fairly accurate so that it will fit in the mortise. So what you have here is a saw that's going to use the full length of your arm movement without so much using the chest or lap that much. So you can gain some accuracy as you're sawing down and sawing up. But you can still use the larger muscles of your upper arm to get the work done. Next up, you have the carcass saw and the sash saw. Most people just call these carcass saws, one's rip, one's cross cut. The rip one is sometimes called a sash saw because they would use these to cut the sashes of windows. It allows a little finer work. They are generally open handle versus, I mean, open handle versus closed handle. This being a closed handle because it gives you a little bit more flexibility that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And they have a specific depth so that you can go down a certain distance, obviously. But it gives you a little bit more control having your hand closer to the teeth line. But once again, notice it reduces the arm movement even less. Because this is a saw that will cut carcasses for like frames and stuff like that. So at this point in time, you are starting to make the cosmetics of the cut matter. 
so it wants to look good. So reduce the body movement, you can re increase the accuracy and increase the looks. Then you have variations of the dovetail saw and a lot of people who are box making they will use these as uh, tenon saws, size saws, carcass saws just because your smaller boxes the more accuracy it will look better. A small gap on a small box looks huge compared to a big gap in like timber framing. <laughs> so a lot of people will use these as all-around saws and I have several of them. Then you have the gent style dovetailing saw. It's just a different handle but you'll notice the length of the blade is fairly consistent to reduce the body's motion and give you accuracy. Okay, right here is my collection of saws, minus the coping, the bow saws, the saws for cutting curves, the Japanese saw, the flush cutting saws, but these are the main joinery saws, and I consider myself more of a joiner. I like making human side stuff. Chairs, cabinets, bookcases, that kind of thing. Something I can actually physically hand to somebody gifting. I don't consider myself a carpenter or a, a general woodworker. I like to specialize in joinery. Hence, I have joinery saws most of the case. I'm going to spend the next five minutes going through each one of these and talking about the, the techniques for using them to maximize their performance as much as possible. And a lot of it comes down to body mechanics. Now, do I use all these saws? No. And right now I have a lot of Veritas saws simply because I think they're a great value and I really like the company. But is a Veritas saw better than a Lee Nielsen Bad Alex or anything like that? Well, after the first sharpening, it all depends upon the skill of the sharpener. You can have the greatest Bad Axe saw out there and if it gets butchered in sharpening, it's going to perform horribly. And then you can go buy a $12 crown Follow off the teeth, reset the teeth, and sharpen them, and do all that kind of stuff to get them just perfectly. And I know some of the best woodworkers I've ever seen, that's exactly what they use. $12 saws that they've resharpened. And since they sharpen their tools every six weeks or so, that wasn't that big a deal for them. Now, I will go into sharpening and teeth geometry and all that kind of stuff in a future video on specifically tarpon sharpening because we can talk about that as we sharpen it. Uh, we'll go into a lot more detail then. For now I'm just going to talk about the general purpose of the saws. Now these are my saws. Do I use all of them? No, I don't. I said I bought the Veritas ones because they were good values. The first saw I bought, what I would call a decent saw, was this dovetail saw. It's a first composite back saw that they offer. And there are good things and bad things about composite back. The good things are they're fairly cheap to manufacture. Some people don't like the look, but they do have a little springiness. So they bounce back fairly easily and they take a lot of abuse. And that's why I bought them from the school I was running. The downside is you can't repair them as easily. Uh, whereas a folded back saw, if the blade gets kinked or something like that, you can just whack it and it'll kind of straighten itself out. But it does get kinked a lot easier than designs like this. There's pluses and minuses of everything. Again, I bought these because I liked the company, I trusted the company, and I thought they were good value. This was the first saw I bought. A few months after they came out of this saw, they offered a set of three saws. So I bought them on their introductory special. As well as whenever they came out with these gent saws, I bought them on an introductory special. So it was like buying one saw and then getting the second one for 20% more. Same thing with the carcass saws, same thing with the tenon saws. Now, does that mean I have extra saws? Yeah, but when it's just a little bit more money to get an extra one, I thought it was worth a while. I don't use them all, and we'll go into that now. Okay, the first tool I want to talk about is the crosscut saw, the panel saw. These are sold at most big box stores. This is a Stanley one. I think they call it the sharp tooth because basically they have hardened the teeth. That makes them sharp a good long time. In fact, I've been using this one for four or five years now, and it's really still pretty sharp. And at 20 bucks, I would almost consider it disposable. I, that's a bad word to say, but yeah, 20 bucks is about what you would spend to have a professional sharpen a saw. Just get a whole new one. Now, I hate the handles, and I have plans on showing you an, a new, a cool little video where you can cut your own handle, and we will show you all the geometry of the handle in relation to the teeth to make it work exceptionally well. But from the get-go, these are great. I keep a short one in my truck so I can break down lumber uh, at the store, and then I keep one here to break down stuff 
This is not the last tool to touch the wood. I will cut these a little bit oversized and finer tools will cut it. Now when you're using these, these are actually designed to be used at 45 degrees. So you have some kind of workbench. A lot of times I work on stools because it gets up a little bit higher. You put your knee and your hand on the work. Now you're going to see me talk about good uh, stance quite a bit and having balance and stability. Stability comes from having three points of contact. Your foot, two feet, a foot, a knee, and a hand. Get those three points. And if at all possible, you want two hands on your saw. One on the saw plate and one on the hand, if not two on the saw. And there's some saws designed to be used exactly like that. And I have one I'll show it to you. And generally, you want to use these at 45 degrees because that's what gets your force coming down once it bites. If you come up higher, you're kind of skipping over the top and you are having to twist your wrist to get it going this direction. At 45 degrees, you have this downward force that's moving it that direction. Just a natural downward force. And that is why the angle, the hang, so to speak, adds at this point. Because it feels natural to push down and it gets the work done. Also, you will see your body has a center line, okay? A lot of times you do not shoot from the hip straight because the resistance of the cut is pushing your shoulder back. The closer you can get the force into your center line, the more accurate you will be. So if you turn your shoulders at about 45 degrees, well, more or less, depending on how much of a gut you have, you can actually push against the center line of your body and you will gain control. That is why a lot of times you will see me talk about putting your shoulders at 45 degrees. Secondly, if you're wanting power, your back foot, can we see the back, I'll move the camera. Your back foot placement. If you have it sideways, you will gain stability. If you point that towards toe forward, you will gain power, okay? Because you will be able to use a little bit of your leg and in, in do it resisting, okay? It's kind of like a football player. You see men at the line, they go in, they bang each other. The guys that are pushing forward, their toes are pointing forward so that they can use their calves to move back. The guys that are resisting have their foot sideways to gain the most stability, the most force into the ground. Same principle here. So, to use this saw properly, use it at 45 degrees, have three points of contact, hopefully two of them will be touching the saw in some play, and move down across your body at about 45 degrees so the resistance is coming straight up into your center line. Now because of the price value and the functionality of this, this is a saw I think most woodworkers should get. You're going to find a use for it. My other hand saw is five rip and it's specifically done for rip. And I originally bought this because I was in a location where I had to keep my band saw and my power tools away from teens and children. So, I would you have to pull this out because believe it or not, I could actually cut a board in half faster with this thing, you know, six or seven boards for our in, prepping for our entire class, than it would have taken me to roll my bandsaw out, set it up, realign it, attach a dove's collector, and then make all the cuts. That's because how I was using it. Once again, these are designed to be used just like I did on that crosscut saw, except you go with the boards. That isn't, isn't how I used it. I don't know why people hate having poles in their shop. Right in the middle of the shop. Everyone complains if it's there because they, they end up putting all their machinery around it because it's just in the way. If you have a pole in your shop, thank your builder. It is the greatest thing in the world if you are hand tool woodworking. Because you can clamp a board to it and all of a sudden this panel saw that only use your back and shoulders Guess what you can use it as? You can now use it as a pit saw. The only difference is how you use your body. If you had that board up here completely stabilized, I can put two hands on my saw. Notice the D8 has this little thumb thing right here. It's designed to be used that way. It's also be designed to use this way, up, straight up and down if you want to sit on a bench to saw like that. I don't know anybody that really does that in real life. But I could blast through boards because I could all of a sudden use all my body just like a pit saw my legs my body and 
using everything, I got a lot less tired than just using my arms. This just took forever. I mean, I could put power into it. It just blasted through stuff. So the variation of why I love this so much and why I could do it so much is because I could use techniques of a bigger saw with a small thing to accomplish the same task. Now, my personal opinion, I'm not a really big fan of vintage saws, but you gotta understand, I come from the joinery side of the world. I use this reflection quite a bit and having all these pits and stuff, it just messes me up. I like a bright, shiny saw. Now, do I still use this saw? No, I don't think I've used this saw in a couple years now. Because my bandsaw is now out, that is my main workhorse for making long rip cuts. I just, I, I don't have to reset it up every time. It's just set up to go. Now, I keep it around because I think maybe someday, and it, it didn't cost me too much to begin with, and if the power ever goes out, I can use it. But do you need a long rip saw? Not really if you have a bandsaw. And the bandsaw is one of the three power tools my personally, I personally think is a requirement. Bandsaw, lathe, thickness planer. Now let's talk dovetail saws. I have five of them. Well, technically I have six because I have a crown somewhere around here that I filed all the teeth off to use in a special kind of joint that doesn't require teeth. But technically I have five usable ones right now. I have these two gents. One's a cross cut, one's a rip. And yes, you can have dovetail saws that are either one because you're cutting at angle, so it kind of does both. Most of the time they are set up as ripped though. And then I have these three original saws I bought. These were the first three I bought. As I said, or I believe I said earlier, the Veritas came out. This was the very first molded spine one they have. It's a 16 tooth uh, dovetail saw. Then they came out with a 20 tooth dovetail saw. Both of these in rip configuration along with a 16 tooth cross cut saw. I don't use these anymore. Uh, when I first got them, I used them a whole bunch because that's all I had. But I found that I've done other things. Now, if you're cutting a lot of dovetails, you will like having a pistol grip a lot more than the gent saw. It is so much more comfortable, you'll be a lot less tired by the end of the day. But the thing is, I bought these gent saws because I was doing a lot of live demos out there. And I built me a little portable tool chest. And I bought these specifically so that they would fit in here. And I ended up using them so much that I'm just more comfortable with them. So this is my main dovetailing saw. Uh, whoops, that's a cross cut one. This is the one you will see me cut most of my dovetails. And it is a 22, 22, no, 20 tooth cut saw, which has its advantages if you're cutting stuff less than 3 eighths of an inch, like small boxes and stuff. Because you'll have at least three or four teeth in the wood at all times and it just kind of tracks a little bit easier. But, uh, having said that, if I were getting this style right here, I would get the higher teeth. Even though most people recommend 16, I would probably get the 20 or 22 tooth kind one, just because you end up using it for the smaller stuff. But once again, these kind of just sit over in the corner and I don't use them that much. Now let's come up to my favorite back saws, the carcass style saws. One's a carcass, one's a sash. I use these constantly, and if there were two saws I would recommend a joiner, a furniture, wannabe furniture maker get, it would be the carcass saws, the cross cut and uh, rip of these. You will use them for everything. A lot of times I find myself cutting dovetails. I just naturally reach for this one because it's the most common one out there, and I don't realize I'm using this saw to cut dovetails until I'm done. I can't really tell the difference. It's because of how you're using it. Most of the time when you're using a carcass saw to cross cut something, maybe you're cutting a leg to length or you're cutting the shoulder of a tenon, you're going to be at your workbench and you're going to be using some kind of appliance to hold the work down. I typically use bench hooks and bench hooks come in pairs. And you come up here, you bump it up so it can lock it down. Then you grab your carcass saw and you use that. You get into your three point stance. Your front foot facing this way. Your back foot on the opposite side of your shoulder. Your shoulder is about 45 degrees with the center of the cut somewhat lined up in the center of your body. You start at the thing and then you lean against the work. This is your third point of contact. You have your two feet, 
the hand forms a triangle and hopefully one finger stays on your saw plate at the whole, so whole time and you just move along. You cut across the top, you follow that line, then you come down your base. Now, one thing that's cool about the saw is you always want to buy a saw where only three finger will fit in, but notice how the handle design. The angle is even more up than the tenon saw. It allows you to come down because you are working below your shoulder level on a workbench most of the time when you're doing cross cuts. Also, look at the heel. See how it's curved? They plan that you are going to come down and bang into the, your bench or your bench hook with that one so they don't want you to pinch your finger. So they make it nice and round so it can work out. Also, notice that the heel of the plate is cut off. That way, if you ever come out of the saw cut and we're coming back in, it's not going to grab. It's going to hit your curve and then pop back up if you're below the line. They really do put a lot of engineering into these. It's really cool. And it's not just Veritas. Most saws that are of any quality are going to have these kind of features. So you come down the base. You hit your baseline there. Notice my handle is on the bench. My tip is on there, and then I can just come out the front and flatten it out and saw down. But once again, my shoulders are about 45 degrees so that my force is coming into my center line. If it was coming outside the center line, the force would actually want to rotate my shoulders every saw cut. It would diminish the accuracy. Also, it cre and creates more movement. Movement diminishes accuracy. Also notice, I'm trying to use a whole saw plate and in doing so, I've got my upper body isolated. I'm going for accuracy here. My upper body is not moving. There you go. Nice smooth cuts. Works very well. It all comes down to body positioning, getting a nice three-point stance, having your toes pointed, the back toe bracing it, not pushing forward so it goes sideways, your shoulders so that you can press against the, the work and keep it in the center line. And the last thing is your arm. So generally when you're doing some kind of ripping cut, whether it's cutting dovetails or tenon, the work is going to be in a clamp held up. But your foot position, your triangle, all that remains in effect. I've got a low angle right here so you can see more of what I'm talking about by my foot position. Now, when I was cutting something up on a pole and I was trying to get the most power, I had both feet moving forward almost as if in a spreading position and I was using my legs to power through. But now that I'm going for accuracy, I want to isolate my leg movement, my lower body movement, so it does not move and give myself the most stability. So that leg moves from a power position to a brace position. And when I was talking about the cheerleader position, it seems like all cheerleaders always stood like that. If you simply extend your front foot in that position, that gives you a nice triangle. So I come over here, I get my back foot putting pretty much horizontal or, or perfect parallel with my work, my front foot going in the direction I want to point, and then I isolate my upper body and complete the triangle stance. Okay, now from this position, you can see that my shoulders are not going to be squared to the work. They're at an angle. They're actually almost a perfect 45 degrees. That's what's having my back foot facing this way, my front foot facing this way, makes it feel comfortable. It also places a cut right at my center line when I'm coming through. But I want you to notice something, the reason why I have the camera right here. If you look at my arm, my knuckle, my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder, all stay in line. There's less movement that way. Remember, the more movement you have, the less accuracy you have. You want to isolate the movement as much as possible. So I'm canted over a little bit to keep that line in parallel. My shoulders are at about 45 degrees. I have the third point of my triangle adding stability and something touching the saw plate. And I come through. You can make very accurate cuts that way. This also places my dominant eye just on the side so you can see the line you're uh, working on. I can either go to this side or this side with just a tilt of my head. So that's what I'm talking about by good potty position. Now, when I'm cutting dovetails on this saw right here, 
I didn't worry about changing the saw, I worried about changing my body movement. What's the difference between a carcass saw and a dovetail saw? Basically lay the length most of the time. So if I just shorten up my stroke, I can gain a lot more control than if I'm using the full stroke and cutting faster. So just as I use that panel saw, that rip saw on that pole, changing it from just using my body to using my full body, I can also go the other direction, shorten up my stroke to gain accuracy. So a quick review of the saws that I couldn't do the work I like to do without. Definitely a carcass and sash saw. Though most people call these carcasses one rip, one cross cut. I do like having a dovetail saw and because of just I'm used to the design, I like the gent saw. But if I'm doing a lot of work, I will dig out the, the pistol grip one because it does work better in your hand. And I'll talk about handle design in a second and why that is. And a good cross cut saw. Everything else, I'll use my band saw for the heavy cross cutting work. And there's very little tenons that I do that's more than three inches deep. And this is almost three inches. So, I mean, this works for cutting tenons. It works for cutting dovetails, uh, the cart, uh, shoulders, legs, links. They're just great all-around saws for general furniture making. Uh, I also, because it goes in my uh, display kit, I had a crosscut saw that I couldn't deal without. I do a lot of minor cross-cutting with it. I just use it all the time. I like these, but that's just a personal preference. So there's our five saws right there that you can do most of the work you see me doing with this set. So now that I've got descriptions and use, let's talk about a little bit more about design. Let's start talking about saw plates. Saw plates are one of those things that, on my own, I don't think I could have figured out how complex they have become, how they've evolved over the years to solve functions until somebody explained it to me. But once somebody explained it to me, it's like, oh, that just makes so much sense. These, these things are really smart. As I say, they're the smartest tools we have in our arsenal. Now, I have my dovetail saw, and if you look at the thickness of it, it is a tad bit under a 64th of an inch. We walk up to my carcass saw, and it is right at a, a little over a 64th of an inch, a little bit thicker. We go up to the tenon saw, and it is almost a 32nd of an inch. We come up to even this cheapo uh, hand saw, cross cut hand saw, and that is a thir little over a 32nd of an inch, a little bit more than that. So, it kind of makes sense that this saw right here does not have a back to it. It does not have some kind of spine that keeps it in tension, so it needs a lot of metal there to keep it from flexing. That's what it's there for. Japanese saws and pull saws can be a lot thinner because when you pull something, it remains in tension. But they work a little bit different than, than we do. A lot of times we are working on benches and that kind of stuff, so we push everything. So you want some tension there. Then you start getting into saws that are powerhouses. They do, they do a lot of work, like this large tenon saw. It is expected to be not only in tension, but also start getting the accuracy. So it adds the same thickness as a hand saw and adds the back to it on top of it to increase its rigidity even more. The cool thing about these, the brass back ones is if you do kink it, they aren't glued in or they shouldn't be glued in so that they can float a little bit. So if it gets a kink, basically one end or the other end will kind of come down a little bit to form that kink and you can whack the back of it to reset it at its baseline and it will straighten back out. These composite ones supposedly have a little bit of flex to them. You can't do that kind of straightening, but they end up not kicking as often. But modern day saws are even. They come from one rolled out piece of steel. They just cut the teeth, they sharpen it, they put the backs on it and gone. But in the old days, that wasn't the case. 
let's measure this old distance saw came, coming from the late 1800s. Uh, it doesn't have a date on it. Uh, it says 1840, but I think that's just a company thing. Down on the baseline where the teeth are, it is a good thick, well over a 32nd of an inch. But let's come up to the top. I do that one, it is under a 32nd, almost to a 64th of an inch. It is thinner on top and thicker on the bottom. Now why would they do that? This is a rough cutting saw, but they did want you to be able to steer it a tad bit. And green wood, which this a lot of times is cutting green wood, tends to close up on top. So having it a little bit thinner on top allows it to close and less bind bind less. It also reduced the weight, uh, yet still allowed it to be really strong on bottom where the teeth were cutting and can't still keep that good stability. You can really push on this. Another thing, and this is where it gets really wild. How many of y'all have ever been cutting and you start getting that vibration, that bang as you go through? That's generally a sign of bad technique where you're not in line, but by having the different thicknesses throughout, guess what it does? It reduces the vibration rate, the, the point at where it wants to vibrate. So it makes it a little bit more stable. I mean, really thinking it out. That is another reason why you see these things tapered quite a bit. Because if it's thinner here, this would have a higher vibration frequency than it was where down thicker. Also, they could actually take a steel plate and they could make two saws out of a sec single section. So it was a manufacturing process additionally, but it did reduce the vibration. And that's why we still have these angled blades when you don't have a back. The backs, the brass backs or these composite backs eliminate the vibration quite a bit. Tapering does somewhat the same thing. Really cool thinking in these designs. Now, why could they get thinner and thinner and thinner the further down you go? Well, think about the amount of work you're doing on this one. You're just using a few muscles. You're not putting a lot of torque on it. It's not taking a lot of wood. There's not a lot of resistance on it. So it's going to buckle less. Having a thinner plate allows a finer curve and gives you a little bit more accuracy. You can snug up to that knife line. Now, I will say this. I, personal opinion, I think sub dovetail manufacturers are going way too thin uh, just to say that they can have it and they market it towards experts only which means that everybody seems to want them you know a good 30 second of an inch that gives you enough resistance and I mean how many dovetails do you really need to get in between that thin I mean very few people are doing those kind of very thin tailed dovetails this getting one that's fairly robust will serve you a lot longer especially if you loan them out to other people because you loan out a thin, thin curved one to a, somebody that just kinks it right off the bat, you're going to be hacked. Now, using a saw with just a saw plate would be kind of painful because these things are kind of sharp. So you need some kind of handle on the saw plate for it to be comfortable for you to use all day. So let's look real quickly talk about handle designs and how they impact the performance and the biomechanics of using a saw. Right now, I have all these saws somewhat lined up so that they are perpendicular to the sides of the bench. So let's talk about hang angle. Hang angle is basically if you draw a line on the handle from the point to the, to the top point so you get the overall angle in relation to the teeth line. And right now on this big panel saw, you can see I'm not quite at 90 degrees, but I am awfully close. I come over to this carcass saw and I get closer to maybe 45 degrees. I come over to this dovetail saw and I am on the other side of 45 degrees. So the hang has increased as I've gone down on my saws. Now obviously a dovetail uh, jet saw has no hang angle, but how you hold it where it sits in your palm creates a natural angle to your hand, which is quite a bit lower than 45, so it's very comparable to what we have here. So let's go to the board real quickly and talk hang angle. So in that big panel saw, we saw that the hang angle was very close to being perpendicular. It's just a little bit off from the baseline of the teeth. Now, if you're pushing that saw, basically your force is going mainly in this direction. Right like that. 
okay? So it's going somewhat forward, just slightly down. Now, if you take your carcass saw that I showed you, which it's hang angle, this being the hang angle of the uh, panel saw, if we increase that hang angle to something like that, all of a sudden the carcass saw's force is going more down like that. The dovetail saw, and obviously I'm exaggerating this a little bit, was quite a bit more than the carcass saw, so its force was coming farther down. Like that. Now, I want you to think about that force on the saw's teeth. If you are pushing forward mainly, the force on the saw teeth on the panel saw, let me get the red marker. <coughs> its force is going mainly this way. So that saw will go across the wood a lot easier. And if you have a really aggressive tooth, hitting almost straight up and down, it will take a nice good shaving, fill up the saw teeth and keep going. And if you have a really long saw plate, that tooth is going to be scraping across a lot of wood. So it will continue to take a shaving and that shaving will just roll up in here and create quite a bit of mess in there, but it won't completely fill up the tooth. Okay? Now, if you shorten that saw plate down a little bit so that individual tooth is not cutting as much wood, having a, for, a force greater coming down, like the carcass saw, it will allow a thicker shaving to fill up that spot in the sawdust. Plus, it will have a little bit more resistance so you can get somewhat a little bit more work done over a shorter uh, pass. Now we come over to this dovetail. Dovetails, once again, really short distance. They can get a lot of sawdust in there and get a lot of work done for the distance they've gone on. Now, have you ever had a saw that was very hard to start? Well, guess which one of these hang angles would be very difficult to start? That dovetail saw that we have over there where the hang angle is really good, big, well, that corner of that tooth is going to be uh, that board is going to be coming in right there it's going to want to grab a little bit more it's not going to want to scoot over so a lot of people say hey well you just need to relax the teeth a little bit sharpen them back a little bit and they'll cut a little bit better but you could also have that aggressive tooth that's going to get a little bit more work done and have a lower hang angle so that the force is going more forward and it will be easier to start so the handle itself can affect not only how much work you do, but how easy it is to do. Once again, a lot of design goes into these things. It's just kind of cool when you see how much thought has gone into the saw's evolution. So let's go look at some other aspects of the handle. Now here's the handle of that old Distant. And even this big manly saw is supposedly doing a lot of the work, Notice the handle is sized so that you cannot get four fingers in there comfortably. It makes you point that index finger, which is a cue to your brain, to move in a straight line. It's amazing. You see people bring their fingers in like that. They always curve in. It just happens over and over and over. But they straighten that finger out, they saw straight. Don't know what it is about the connection between that and your brain. But having these three finger holes forces you to point that index finger. Plus, it comes out very comfortably. Notice that the bend on this saw, because this saw's hang is so, uh, so up and down, it's a little bit lower. So you hold the saw a little bit lower as you move it through. That right there is adjustable. And a lot of old time saws you see, people have filed them down so that they will fit in their palm just the way they want. You adjust these handles. Me personally, I think this one's a tad bit thin. I should go back through it, but it's a vintage one and I don't use it that much, so no big deal. Then you also have this modern day ones and you see a lot of them the same design. You look at this shape right here. That seems kind of like an odd shape when you think about it, but it fits your palm. Your palm has that curve right there. So you can hold this saw without squeezing it. Your fan, hand, fan fit in there, it will stay in your hand. It's resting right here. I can just dangle one finger. There's no gripping this saw right now, and it stays perfectly. 
That way you can use it all day long. What's really strange is if you squeeze it, you're guaranteed to get offline. Because watch what happens when you squeeze a saw. See how it rotates? All I'm doing is squeezing down. It automatically rotates. A saw is designed to hold in your hand without having to grip it. That's all that design. It will pivot off at that point. Also the fact if you ever need a starter saw, because of the way it's set up, can you see my hand? If you ever, when you start it, if you squeeze with your middle finger, it kind of pivots up. So it makes it easier to start on the toe. Lots of engineering in these things. These open toed ones. Once again, they designed this bottom hook right there so it's very uncomfortable but put four fingers in so it forces you. These things, saws are trying to outsmart their power source because they evolved to work as well as they can. It forces you to point that index finger. And I've already talked about how it's curved like that so you can bang it in when you're using a bench cook because this kind of saw is generally used on a bench Whereas these tenon saws and that, those other kinds of saws, which have closed toes, are generally used either on a, a saw bench or up in a vise. So they, they, they aren't banging into stuff. I like this handle design on the jet saw. It's the most comfortable jet saw I've ever used. And you don't think about it, but this has a straight curve right there that tapers up. And then a certain curve that comes down. And then this little point right there, which just fits your hand perfectly so your knuckle is right there encouraging you to point it and it curves around that point. I mean it's just an incredibly comfortable handle that encourages you to use proper hand position. Also the fact where it sits right there it lines up with my bones just nicely. I, I'm just used to this thing. It's pretty well done. And once again all these handles are designed to be held in your hand as a natural extension coming through your wrist and stuff like that without having to squeeze. A death grip is a bad thing when you're doing saws. Well, I hope now you have a better appreciation of why saws, saws evolved the way they did. They have a lot of flexibility in them. They can go for high precision to high power, not quite at the same time, and I think you understand why, and a lot of that has to do with body mechanics. I mean, taking it back to golf, me and Tiger Woods both have very similar, well, not so similar uh, strokes. Basically, a lot of it has to do with he's in shape and I am a shape. He's hot, hit a couple billion balls and I've hit tennis balls. But the principle of how we use the tools, whether we use a lot of muscle or a little muscle, is valid. And is, is there anybody out there that doesn't think that Tiger Woods couldn't take one club of five iron and kick my butt? Would he use that five iron the same way? No. If he was king off the king off at the start, he'd be taking that full swing and whacking it as hard as he could. He would then use the five iron as it is intended on the fairway. But when he got up to putt, I guarantee he would be locking everything down and just twisting over. You can do the same thing. One saw, a carcass saw, can cut very fine dovetails. All you have to do is adjust your technique. If you need to cut a thick tenon, you want to get after a little bit more, put a little bit more muscle into it, put a little bit more juice into it, and it will work just fine. You can get away with doing a lot of variations with one tool, just use it as other tools. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, Consider liking, favoring, sharing, subscribing, all that kind of stuff. You can also visit our website. We have a lot of products there that when we sell them, that really does help support continuing on this classroom series and making quite a bit more. We even have t-shirts, artworks, and stuff like that. Now for our next video in this chapter 3 on saws, go ahead and get yourself a little one by two or one by three from the big box store. Uh, they're a little bit expensive, but they are pre-dimensioned. Uh, and we will do the next exercise using this material, and we will go into a lot more detail on sawing techniques for accuracy. And once again, if you haven't watched the other preliminary chapters in this series, go check them out in our classroom video playlist at Worth the Effort uh, channel on YouTube. And I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.
And if you didn't get the joke, the saw didn't evolve through Darwinism. It evolved through the hard work of men and women who have been using this tool over centuries. It was craftsmen, not scientists, not the elite, not artists, not the educated, real craftsmen that evolved this thing to be a beautiful extension of your hand used to create stuff. Remember that the next time you're able to saw a straight line with a hunk of wood and metal.